The chant which we do initially on these puja occasions is a homage to the triple gem, to Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha. I thought this evening I would like to talk a little bit about the middle one, the Dhamma. What is the Dhamma? What does it mean? What's the importance? And so forth. Dhamma is the Pali word. In Sanskrit it's Dharma. And it has... A variety of meanings depending on context. In the most general universal sense, the Dhamma is the way things are. It's natural law. In the Pali, there's a derivative of Dhamma, Dhammata, which means according to nature, naturally. It said that the Dhamma exists whether a Buddha proclaims it or not. It's just that it's not understood or known. In a more specific sense, the Dhamma refers to the Dhamma of the Buddha, sometimes in the compound Buddha Dhamma, which is the teachings of the Buddha or his explanation, his declaration of the Dhamma in the more universal sense. Nothing that the Buddha taught was his own invention. It is a declaration or an explanation of an existing Dhamma. Of course, as a individual human being located in a certain time and place, culturally, historically specific, this flavors his presentation of the Dhamma. So we have the Dhamma of the Buddha reflects the uh, the language and the cultural norms of 6th century BC India. But the truths that he proclaims are universal. There is also another very specific use of the word Dhamma, which is found in primarily in the Abhidhamma texts, Dhamma as an object. An object of consciousness is called a Dhamma. So any phenomena in the universe which is capable of being an object of consciousness is a Dhamma. In English texts, often the two uses of Dhamma are distinguished by capital D for Dhamma as teaching or Dhamma as universal law and small d for Dhamma as an object of consciousness. But this is really a modern affectation. The Pali language in its original form, is purely oral and has no place for capitals or uppercase. The alphabets of Asia, uh, Sinhalese, Siamese, Burmese, in which Pali is often written, they also don't use capitals. So there isn't really an absolute distinction between the two uses of the word Dhamma. A Dhamma is a truth, Each Dhamma which arises to consciousness is a momentary truth known to the conscious mind. As we noted, the Dhamma precedes the Buddha and it also, in another sense, has precedence over Buddha. Shortly after his awakening and his encounter with Brahma Sahampati, the Buddha was reflecting that, and this is quite an interesting short sutta in the Samyutta Nikaya, the Buddha is reflecting about beings in the world, that all beings need something to honor, revere, and serve. And if they're lacking that, then they, they experience suffering. So he examined with his Buddha mind all the different realms of being, searching for someone, be it human or a Dewa or a Brahma, 
who might be worthy of his veneration and service, and he found none. So he decided, I shall devote my life to serving the Dhamma. So even the Buddha felt a need to have something higher to venerate and devote his life to. The characteristic of a Buddha in relation to the Dhamma is that the Buddha is the one who has fully penetrated the Dhamma and fully seen the, the way things are, has fully penetrated the nature of reality. So then he is able to express it and teach it, and this becomes the Dhamma that we find in the, in the texts and the Dhamma we hear in, in uh, teachings is an exposition of the reality of things as they are. In the chant, we list as objects of contemplation several attributes of the Dhamma. Sandidiko, this means that the Dhamma is immediately apparent. The root in here is dit, diti, for a view, an object of eye consciousness taken metaphorically to represent a view and understanding. And sang is means with. It's a prefix. So what this, uh, this word means is that it's capable of being known. The common translation for this is apparent here and now. What it more precisely means is that it's available as a possibility of realizing the Dhamma at all times. It's immediately apparent. It's not something far away, something lost, something mysterious. The Dhamma is right here. And this is where it ties in with the meaning of Dhamma as an object of consciousness. Because if we're fully conscious of the objects as they arise to the mind, then we're experiencing the Dhamma in that moment. This particular slice of reality, which is a single object of mind moment, can be generalized, universalized, by way of the three characteristics. It's impermanent, it's imperfect, and it's empty. So the Sandidiko tells us not to think of the Dhamma as something mysterious or exotic or far away. It's something immediate, present before the mind at each moment. We just have to wake up to it. A Kaliko, Kala is time. A is the negative prefix. So a Kalako is translated as timeless. This is a number of possible mutually reinforcing interpretations. We can see timeless as meaning that the Dhamma is a timeless truth in the sense that although the Buddha expressed it you know, 2,600 years ago, it's still valid today. And it'll be valid as a universal truth, even after the sun burns out, this system of the universe is finished. The Dhamma is still just an underlying truth. It's a universal law. It's also timeless in the sense that the realization of the Dhamma is immediate. It's not something that needs to be put off into some indefinite future. The Dhamma is right now. And this sense of being in the present moment, being in the now, is itself a, a sense of timelessness. It's also a entry point into emptiness, into the not-self. Because constructed self is only present when there's a sense of time. When we identify a self, 
it's always a projection into the past and future. If you're trying to describe who you are to somebody, you're likely to go back into the past and tell them your history. I was born in such and such a place in such and such a year, and I went to school there, and I had a job here. And, uh, so you identify yourself by your history. You know, it's a past. Past reference. Or you can identify a self projected into the future, which is when we dwell on our plans, our hopes, our fears and anxieties. We're projecting into the future. And there's a sense of self. But in the present moment, immediately there's just awareness and an object, a Dhamma. There's no sense of self in the, in the purely in the present moment. And the highest realization, the, the unconditioned, is being beyond time and space altogether. So it's also timeless in that sense, ekaliko. Ehipasiko. This means come and see. It's a literal translation, come and see. Ehi is an imperative noun to come. And pasiko is derived from the verb to see. This expresses the Buddha's confidence in the truth of his teaching that he says, come and examine it for yourself. Come and check it out. This is a teaching that is beneficial and that that works. And if you come and examine it, you will confirm that. Ehipasiko. It's a small digression, but a note that this verb ehi, it also occurs in the Vinaya stories of the foundation of the Sangha. In the early days, the first few years, the Buddha practiced what's called the ehi ordination, ehi bhikkhu ordination. When someone was to ordain as a bhikkhu, the only ceremony required was that the Buddha would say, Ehi bhikkhu, come here bhikkhu, and the person would be ordained. And it said in the commentary that he would miraculously lose all his hair and, and get robes in a bowl, physically transformed. Now this, uh, in the, uh, as an attribute of the Dhamma, is Ehi pasiko, is come and see. Opanayiko. This means that the Dhamma is leading onwards. It's progressive. It's going somewhere. It's also possible to interpret this as leading inwards, which means you going into the depth of your own being to realize the Dhamma. And essentially, the two meanings are, are the same. And I think leading onwards is actually linguistically is closer to the to the meaning. This means that the Dhamma, when it's practiced, it has results. It does things. It changes the uh, the practitioner. It purifies the being. It opens the mind. It frees the being from defilement. This is discovering the Dhamma for oneself. And the last attribute is the longest one in Pali, Pachitang We Titabo Win Yuhi, which means it's capable of being known by the wise. This is something the Buddha, from the very beginning, said that the, the teaching is for those with little dust in their eyes. There are those in the world with little dust in their eyes perishing for lack of the Dhamma. So there's a sense in the Theravada teaching, at least, that not all beings 
at least in their present lifetime, in their present form, are capable of realization. On the other hand, there's no sense of eternal damnation in Buddhism either, that there's always a possibility of progressive improvement and taking a better rebirth. But the realization of, of Dhamma is, first of all, most conducive to one in a human form. It's very difficult, it's impossible for an animal to realize the unconditioned, and it's very difficult for Dewas and Brahmas. A human has the right proportion of pleasure and pain. There's enough suffering in the human life to realize there's something wrong. There's a the, the conditioned existence is lacking. This is a realization missed by the Dewas, whose existence is one of pure pleasure. So they don't realize until it's too late that uh, there there's some something needs doing. And on the other hand, there is. For most humans, most of the time, there's enough ease and comfort that it is possible to practice. Whereas for a being in the ghost realm or the hell realm, there's it's constant misery. They have no leisure or space to practice. Even being in the human realm, the human beings vary in their degree of what are called the, the paramis is spiritual faculties that we build up over many lifetimes. Yeah. One reflection that's that's um, worth taking on is how rare the opportunity to practice the Dhamma is. And you have in this lifetime an extremely rare situation. It's like winning the 649 lottery three weeks in a row. You've got a a human birth in a period of time when the Buddhist teaching are still extant and you're able to hear the Buddhist teaching and you've got some capacity and ability to understand and to practice the Buddhist teaching. So all this together is the result of very fortunate past kama and accumulation of paramis over many lifetimes. And it's like a wonderful window of opportunity. The rareness of a human birth is said to be like a tortoise at the bottom of the ocean, a blind tortoise. And once every hundred years, he comes up for air. And somewhere in the ocean, there's a, a yoke floating. And if by chance he puts his head through the yoke, that's like the, the odds of taking a human birth after having fallen to the lower realms. The Buddha said, numerous are the beings in the lower realms. Few are beings in the human realm. We tend to easily take it for granted, the fact of being human, because you know, we're human and probably most of the people we know are human. So we sort of, it's just a, take it for granted and we hear about how populated the earth is but if you just consider the number of bugs and insects and worms you know, they vastly vastly outnumber human beings yeah. and there's millions and millions of of creatures living in a bucket of soil and this is swarms of insects and all the little microscopic creatures in the in the waters and in the oceans. There's no there's no comparison. And being human at a time when the Buddha's teaching is still extant is also very rare. Many thousands of world ages, kappas can go by without the appearance of a Buddha. In a Buddhist teaching, the expression, the, the 
formal expression of Dhamma that is a Buddha's teaching is itself uh, a conditioned thing and it's impermanent. It's expressing the unconditioned, but it's a form. So it has its its lifespan, and the Buddhist teaching will sometime in the future be forgotten, and there'll be an age without any knowledge of the Buddhist teaching. And there was a long age before the current Buddha when there was no Buddha teaching. So there's only this little sliver of opportunity in, in the long stretch of time. So this attribute of Dhamma, Pachatangwe Titabo in Yuhiti, is meant to remind you of the preciousness, the rareness of this opportunity of having a contact with the Dhamma and a possibility of practicing the Dhamma. So these are the attributes of the Dhamma that we cite in this particular sutta for objects of contemplation. They primarily reference the meaning of Dhamma as the teaching of the Buddha as an expression of the universal Dhamma. The expression of the Dhamma that we have at this time, the primary source is found in the, the Pali Canon, in the texts of the, the Buddha's discourses and in the Sutta Pitaka and the uh, rules and, and procedures for the, the monks in the Vinaya and the more psychological teachings in the Abhidhamma. These are the three baskets of, of the, the, the teachings, the Pitaka, the Thai Pitaka. But this is the formal expression, the, the enunciation of the Dhamma coming in a particular form for this place and time, this Buddha age. This is the expression of the Dhamma that we have. But the truths encapsulated in it are universal. And realizing the immediate Dhamma present at each moment is is the essence of the practice to be present with this particular dhamma that's presented to consciousness gives you a example of the greater dhamma this is the reality at this moment there's mind arising to an object And if you can experience that immediately, directly, then you're experiencing Dhamma. It's Sandidiko, it's apparent here and now. And you can gain this sense of timelessness, the Akaliko, by being absolutely in the present moment, you're timeless. And you're you're checking it out, you're examining it. Ehipasiko, you're taking the Buddha's offer to come in and look, come and see. And it leads onwards, it carries you along, it's opanaiko. And it leads to the dawning of wisdom and the potential of seeing not only the reality of the conditioned, but seeing through the conditioned into the unconditioned. And this is Vaitita Bo and Yuhiti. So this is a few words on the nature and meaning of Dhamma.